This is part three, political and economic resistance to Jim Crow. The African-American community across the United States responded to Jim Crow's intensification after 1900 with local protests, national organizing, and by creating self-sufficient neighborhoods of relative prosperity. This isn't to say that Jim Crow was benign or that African-Americans did well under it. The entire system was designed without shame to create a racial caste system that deprived one group while privileging another. What I'm saying here is that the horror stories that have come to be the face of Jim Crow discrimination, the plight and suppression of rural sharecroppers, the vastly different state support for education that did indeed dominate the Jim Crow era, is that African Americans did not accept subjugation without resistance. We'll look at five examples of such resistance, boycotts of segregated streetcars, the founding of the NAACP, the black separatism of Marcus Garvey, the creation of so-called Black Wall Streets, and the Great Migration. In talking about streetcar boycotts, my source of information for this portion of the lecture is a 1969 article by August Meyer and Elliot Rudwick entitled, The Boycott Movement Against Jim Crow Streetcars in the South, 1900 to 1906. I've linked it to our class readings in this Canvas module. Streetcars were a principal mode of transportation even in small cities. They began as horse-drawn cars, then expanded into electric-powered cars like you see here and like still exist in New Orleans. San Francisco developed cable cars that operate by grabbing a constantly moving cable under the track. This defeated the steep hills and icy winter tracks that made other kinds of cars not work in San Francisco. In the South, cities had tried to segregate streetcars after emancipation with little success in the face of occasional boycotts, and the weak streetcar segregation laws passed by some places in the 1890s brought their own boycotts. But beginning in 1900, Many southern cities passed ordinances and southern states passed statutes that both firmly segregated streetcars and even more objectionable to the black community than segregation placed police power in the hands of conductors and motormen on those streetcars who were usually working class men with no old sense of noblesse oblige that had marked race relations in the 19th century. So here's the deal. Many black streetcar passengers were middle-class male professionals like doctors, lawyers, and preachers, and also their wives and children. White conductors and white motormen were already overbearing and insulting, and giving them the power of law brought class conflict and racial conflict into the open. Thus, the elites of the black community led these boycotts in more than 25 towns and cities where they had occurred. As we'll see in the next slide, some boycotts occurred immediately after passage of ordinances and statutes, and occasionally while city councils were even considering passage, while others lagged behind state statutes and found another spark. Boycotters who could not walk to their destinations, usually jobs, often took black-owned hacks, that is, horse-driven carriages. In two cities, Portmouth, Virginia, and Chattanooga, Tennessee, boycotters also created and operated their own streetcar lines. These were crushed by animal control officers who determined that the horses these lines used were being cruelly treated. In other places, boycotters tried to sue or to counter with legislation, but generally to no avail. Most of the boycotts were relatively short, measurable in days or weeks. A few, like the Montgomery action, lasted months. In their first days, the boycotts were usually pretty effective, reducing ridership and revenue enough that newspapers noticed and companies complained. For example, in Savannah and Houston, companies lost large amounts of revenue. But fatigue set in, and the authorities countered suspected harassment of those who broke the boycott. So many of the boycotts failed. In Jacksonville, Florida, Montgomery, Alabama, and Mobile, Alabama, the boycotts temporarily succeeded in halting enforcement of segregation by the traction companies, but eventually Jim Crow crept back onto the streetcars. <laughs>
This slide shows a grid of when a city that experienced a boycott did so in green. Yellow designates the year when the city passed a streetcar segregation ordinance, and gold indicates when the state passed a segregation statute. You see, for example, that Houston and San Antonio both passed streetcar ordinances in 1904, then experienced a boycott. Then the state of Texas passed streetcar statutes in 1907. You can also see that more than a year passed between the time Virginia passed its statute and Virginia cities had boycotts, and more than five years passed between Savannah streetcar ordinance and the boycott that happened there. These were often triggered by enforcement of the streetcar segregation ordinances and uh, statutes. Blacks, with their white allies, did not let Jim Crow go unchallenged. Like the moderate elites who led the streetcar boycotts, the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, used the tools of American society to promote justice and equality for African Americans. The NAACP in particular used the law to fight Jim Crow. The Springfield race riot of 1908 spurred the founding of the NAACP a group of interconnected white liberals, some of whom were descendants of abolitionists, called for a meeting to plan a counter to racial violence and discrimination in law. Among the group of 60 who attended were W.E.B. Du Bois, muckraking journalist Ida Wells Barnett, and educator Mary Church Farrell. The NAACP mirrored the Niagara Movement's interest in securing minority rights under the 14th and 15th Amendments through democratic means. It established a national headquarters in New York City in 1909 and grew to a national organization of 300 branches and 90,000 members by 1919. Its board and membership were racially integrated, but it did not have black officers until the 1920s. The journal and its chief organ called The Crisis was edited and controlled by W.E.B. Du Bois from 1910 until 1934. Some of the work of the NAACP uh, was to sue to eradicate the voting, uh, quote, grandfather clause, unquote. They did public battle with the D.W. Griffith film, Birth of a Nation, that made blacks into villains and valorized the Ku Klux Klan, and they fought a long legal and publicity war against lynching in an effort to secure a federal law prohibiting it. After World War I, the NAACP fell on hard times but recovered in the 1940s. In the 1950s, it led, among other suits, the Brown v. Board case that overturned Plessy v. Ferguson. Another version of black resistance to Jim Crow manifests in the person of Marcus Garvey and the organization he founded in 1914 in Jamaica, the United Negro Improvement Association. Garvey was born in Jamaica and spent a little time in London before returning there in 1914 and founding the UNIA, quote, to establish a brotherhood among the black race, to promote the spirit of race pride, to reclaim the fallen, and to assist in civilizing the backwards tribes of Africa, unquote. He also appropriated the term Negro, which in Jamaica was a pejorative, and he repurposed it to cover all black peoples. Garvey immigrated to the U.S. in 1916, and then in 1917 organized a branch of the UNIA in New York. He incorporated it in 1918 with the aim of creating black-run businesses. He started the Negro World newspaper that drew initial funds from people like Madam C.J. Walker, but he refused to run hair straightening and skin lightening advertisements, thus harming his revenue stream. Nevertheless, by 1919, the UNIA had 25 branches in the U.S. and some in the Caribbean and even West Africa. The UNIA and NAACP had an uneasy partnership until Garvey and Du Bois came to dislike one another, and Garvey opposed both integration and working with white people. In fact, in the 1920s, Garvey allied with the Ku Klux Klan. They wanted the same end goal, though for different reasons, separation of the races, and for Garvey, 
black self-sufficiency as well as a return to Africa. To this end, he created the Negro Factories Corporation that operated groceries, eateries, laundries, and a publisher. He established links to the government of Liberia in hopes of settling African Americans there. He also established a steamship company, the Black Star Line, the name is in uh, competition with a major steamship co uh, company called the White Star Line, to run between New York, Liberia, and the Caribbean. Its first ship had a lot of problems and a lot of breakdowns, but the company grew slowly. In 1922, Garvey was charged with mail fraud for selling stock in a ship the Black Star Line did not yet own. He was found guilty in 1923, appealed his con uh, conviction to 1925, then was imprisoned until being deported in 1927. Garvey returned to Jamaica uh, until 1935, then moved to London where he died in 1940. His wife ran the UNIA after his arrest, and many of its members lasted a long, long time. Earlier than, and also contemporarily with the streetcar boycotts, the creation of the NAACP and the manifestation of black nationalism and separatism of Marcus Garvey was the growth of prosperous sections of cities known collectively as Black Wall Streets. Segregated blacks didn't just languish in repression and miserable sharecropping. They went to cities. Many inner professions started businesses and built reasonably prosperous communities like the four block Parish Street District of Durham, North Carolina, the Sweet Auburn District of Atlanta, and the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Greenwood District of Tulsa has been in the news since 2021 because of the 100th anniversary of its destruction in a riot that I discussed in the Jim Crow lecture and because of the HBO television series, Watchmen. Let's look a bit more closely at Greenwood, the Black Wall Street of Tulsa. Tulsa itself was founded in the late 1820s by Creek natives displaced from Alabama and Georgia, but was assured of growth when the railroad came through to serve local ranchers. It was incorporated in 1896 and grew even faster when oil was discovered nearby in 1901, and then more was discovered in 1905 and that turned it into a boom town that drew businesses and workers, including African Americans. And this is part of the great migration that we'll discuss in a slightly uh, later uh, in this lecture. Entrepreneurs O.W. Gurley and J.B. Stradford began buying land in an unincorporated area north of the rail tracks in Tulsa and began building homes and service businesses for black residents. Gurley named the main thoroughfare Greenwood Avenue. Blacks worked in the oil fields, in white-owned businesses, and as domestic servants to white families. They made money in the white neighborhoods, but spent it almost exclusively in the Greenwood district. Both entrepreneurs became rich as white dollars circulated in black Greenwood 26 times before leaving. Oklahoma became a state in 1907, and Tulsa annexed Greenwood in 1909. Greenwood's population grew from about 2,000 to 8,000 in just a few years, largely because of the post-statehood virulence of Jim Crow legislation. It achieved its moniker, the Negro Wall Street, from Booker T. Washington. This thriving business district was destroyed by a white-led riot and massacre in 1921 that not only ruined the wealth of the district, but ran most of its inhabitants out of town. Blacks rebuilt the district so that by 1942, it was almost as prosperous as it had been in 1921. 